OK, thanks. So we have a nice example here. When I came in, the room was 3% full. And asymptotically, if we go to infinity, it will obviously be over full. So to, to explain even what I know about asymptotics would take a semester, and to explain the whole subject probably years. So I'm going to give kind of an impressionistic account a few things that I like that are nice techniques that, in my experience, neither mathematicians nor physicists necessarily know, and that would be extremely useful in many problems that they see. So I'm going to tell them very informally. You can certainly interrupt and should. And also, I'll essentially not give any proofs of anything. But if, after the coffee, there's anybody comes back and somebody would like me to speak about one of the topics in more detail, I can sort of do it ad hoc. So you know, asymptotics means a lot of things. So for instance, I mean, something that's rather amusing is, to me is that people talk about asymptotic expansions. So you take, I don't know, something like the integral e to the t over t dt from 0 to x. And then that has an asymptotic expansion that you can compute very easily because there's a differential equation. And so typically, it might be that as x goes to infinity, that it's a0 plus a1 over x plus a2 over x squared, where the series, however, doesn't converge. And the meaning of asymptotics is in the sense of asymptotic series that f of x has this limit, that if you take two terms, that it's more accurate. If you take three terms, it's more accurate. So the more terms you take, the smaller the error grows. In other words, at each stage, if you take n terms, the difference is asymptotically equal to the next term. So what's amusing is that's a word that we all see in our lives. And it's a little mysterious because the series diverges. But there's another thing which is very familiar, which is called the C infinity function, which is a function which has a Taylor series to all orders which doesn't have to converge because it's not analytic. It's just C infinity. So it's got a Taylor series. And of course, that's exactly the same thing. So the same concept goes under two different names, one very familiar and one always shrouded in a bit of mystery. Now, what I want to talk about is first a practical problem that comes up all of the time. And actually, my second example, I was particularly, sorry. I can't hear you at all. Oh, well, then I'll go from 1 to x. OK. I don't care. Good point. There is a problem with the integral, but we're not going to let little things like that stop us. OK. I could also subtract 1 here. I, thought, I hoped it was so small you couldn't see it. So, so what I want to first tell is, I say, it's a trick, a numerical trick that I found many years ago, and I use, I'd say, twice a week. It's very useful, but I've never met anyone who knows it. I'm sure it's not new. But it's somehow not standard. And I was very delighted, well, it would be anyway, that Boris Dubrovin is here today. Because one of my examples is a numerical example I took from an old paper of his. It was just in my files. I took it at random. I have many examples, but the one I had chosen. So the question is this. Let's say that you have a sequence of numbers, a1, a2. There might be an a0. I don't care. We're interested as n goes to infinity. And you believe, you think that the an maybe has a limit. So let's just start with that. But you think that it achieves the limit very regularly. Now, believe it or not, there are mathematicians who will simply make a table. That, so let's say you can compute them up to 500. But it's too expensive. You can't compute up to a trillion. You can compute up to 100 or 1,000 one at a time. But you can't compute a lot. So there are actually mathematicians who will write a paper and say, well, we computed up to 1,000. A1,000 was you know, 3.62. And so, but you know, A900 was 3.59. So just eyeballing it, it's probably about 3.7 or something. I mean, just completely vague. Or there are also mathematicians who will make a graph and graph the first things up to 100. And then you try to eyeball this and decide what the limit is, even to one decimal. You can't do it. So at the very least, uh, what you should do is you should graph 1 over n. So you take 1, a half, a third, a quarter, a fifth, of course, you'll stop at 1,000. You can't go all the way to 0 because you can't go to infinity. But then at least your numbers will look like this. And they will have a very clear linear dependence at the end. 
And at least eyeballing will give you, let's say, two decimals. But let's say you don't want two decimals, but 2,000 decimals. So you really want to extrapolate rapidly and highly correctly. So the numbers themselves you have precisely. They're either rational or if you compute it to high accuracy, but you only have 500 of them, let's say, a few hundred. So let's say, of course, it depends on the speed of convergence. If it's a plus e to the minus e to the n, there's no problem. But let's say that a n has an asymptotic expansion, a zero, which would be the a plus a one over n. You may not know that. It may only be a conjecture. But the method will test at the same time that this hypothesis is true. And so then you want to find the limit a0. And actually, you'd, like to quite, you'd quite like to find a1 and a2 also. So before I tell you the method, let me give you two numerical examples just to show you the kind of problem that you can apply this to. But as I say, every, every week I use this. There are always numbers coming up. So the first example is the famous Apéry numbers, Apéry numbers an. So they're 1, 5, 73, 1, 4, 4, 5. They grow quite quickly, as you can see. So this is a0, a1, a2, a3. An is the sum, k from 0 to n, n over k squared, n plus k over k squared. And you can see that they grow quickly. Well, here, of course, they won't have a limit. So in this case, if you look very roughly, you'll soon see, let me get the notation consistent with what I had, that it would seem that it's a constant times an exponential times maybe a power of n, and then maybe 1 plus a1 over n plus, well, now I'm changing notation too much, b1, b2 over n squared, and so on. Of course, I could include the c into this and put you know, a0 or c0 plus c1 plus c2, but a small remark is that in practice, very often, when you have such an asymptotic expansion, this is a very frequent form, a pure exponential, a power of n, and then a power series in one over n, very often there's a prefactor which is very transcendental, but the remaining func uh, functions, uh, the remaining coefficients are then rational or much simpler. So it's always a good idea to take out this function. So the question is, how can I find these numbers numerically? So let me just show what the method is able to do for you without yet saying how. So I just checked this last night on my computer so that I wouldn't be lying in the numbers. I computed in Paris, which is, for this kind of thing, the only really good program to use, GP Paris. I computed A1 up to A500. That took you know, a hundredth of a second. So I have 500 values. And from these 500 values, I'd like to get C and A and lambda and B1 and B2 and B3 to very, very high precision. But you know, 500 isn't that big. So I'll just tell you the result of the calculation first. The calculation tells me, first, that the um, C sorry, A, is 33.970562748. This is by numerical extrapolation by method that I'll show you in, in, in five minutes. Just numerically, using only 500 values, you can predict that A to about 20 digits is that. And then if you're good at recognizing numbers, which is a good thing to be in this field, then you'll find that 1 plus square root of 2 to the fourth is 33 times the same thing up to towards the end, where it becomes uh, 5, sorry, that was 5, 5, 2, and the other is 6, 1. So it's pretty good. So we have a numerical method that using only a mere 500 values that you can compute in a so, tiny fraction of a second will give you A. And then still on the same computer, then I plug in this A, I look for lambda, and I find minus 1.5000 to a whole bunch of zeros, like 30 zeros. So we're already beginning to find here 1 plus the square root of 2 to the 4n divided by n to the 3 halves. Then if you look a little more at the next coefficient, I'm not going to write out the decimals. Again, you can recognize the next coefficient, the c. And the c is a little complicated. It's 1 plus the square root of 2 squared divided by 2 to the 9 fourths times pi to the 3 halves. I'm not going to tell you how you recognize numbers like that. That's another story, but it's easy. So here, that would mean 4n plus 2 times 2 to the 9 fourths times pi n to the 3 halves. So this would be the main term. And then uh, similarly, b1 and b2, I'll give a couple of values. b1 is equal to minus 0 0.4185. You still get 30 digits, or 20 or something, even for that. And then you recognize that as 
48 minus 15 squared of 2 over 64. So as I said, the numbers after the constant are simpler. But in this case, they're not rational. They're all in Q of squared of 2. But the C was much more complicated. It was this. So it was still intelligent to pull it out, even though these numbers weren't rational. And similarly, the next one you recognize numerically as 2057 minus 1,200 squared of 2 over 2 to the 8th, uh, 2 to the 12th, and so on. And you can recognize maybe 10 or 15 coefficients to high enough accuracy to uniquely write them down just with 500 values. So the second example, before I show you the method, as I said, I, I read this particular thing in a paper of de Proven of a certain number of years ago on the quantum cohomology of the projective plane. And so there's a famous set of numbers, nk, is the number of rational curves of degree k. It doesn't matter if, if this doesn't interest you. It's just a number for the moment uh, through 3k minus 1 generic points in the plane. So you take sort of 3k minus 1 random points, and that's just the right number that you can force a rational curve of degree k to go through them. But then you'll find many. So if you make a little table, well, for k equals 1, of course, there's only one line through two points by Euclid. If k is 2, there's only one quadric through five, uh, through four, uh, five points. So it's 1. For 3, it's 12. For 4, it's 620. And for 5, it's 87,304. So you can see these numbers grow very fast. And of course, one wants to know how they grow. So there's a long story about this. But in particular, Konsevich found a recursion, a non-differential, a non-linear differential equation for the generating function, which implies a non-linear recursion for the nk. So you can easily compute, let's say, 1,000 values or 10,000, but you can't compute for a trillion. You don't have anything like a closed form. You can only compute them inductively. So the question is, given this, how can you work out the, the asymptotics? So in the paper of, of uh, de Proven that I quoted, he quoted from an earlier paper of Itzikson and uh, Di Francesco, but numerically, and those are also very good. Well, Itzikson was a very famous mathematical physicist. These were extremely good people. And what they found, well, they did guess the power of k. It was 7 halves. But they found roughly c, a to the k. And I'm quoting from, from the paper where a, the important one, the exponential is about 0 0.138, and c is about. Uh, 6.1, quoted verbatim from the paper. But with the method that I'm about to show you, you will get that A is actually 0 0.138009346634525257. In this case, I couldn't recognize it, so it didn't help. But you can never recognize three digits. At least here you have a chance. And C, I also have lots of digits. And actually, it continues. Uh, and I have many, you know, several, several more coefficients to high accuracy. So how does this work? And now with all this preamble, the actual method is trivial and very amusing. So first, let me reduce the general problem. So the, the, the general problem was I have an a n with some behavior, c a to the n, n to the lambda. Well, let's put it here, c 0 plus c 1 over n plus so on. And I want to find first a, the most important, then lambda, then c 0, c 1, and so on. Let's take the more special problem that I started with that you simply have a sequence of numbers which has a limit. And you want to find the limit, and so on. So let's say here I want to find a and lambda and c0 and c1. This is a special case. a is known to be 1, lambda is known to be 0, and I only want c0. But the first trivial remark is that if you can solve this easier problem, you can solve them all. Because if you have this, then you see immediately that a n over a n minus 1 will start like a times 1 plus lambda over n, or maybe lambda plus n something. So if you can do this problem, you'll get the a already. But then you can remove the a, multiply by n, and then you'll get the lambda. And you can see that in general, if you know how to get c0, nothing will stop you once you've found c0 from looking at the new set sequence of numbers a and minus c0, multiplying by n, and now they'll start c1 plus c2 over n. And so you applied the same method you used. So if you can solve this problem to get c0, you can also get c1, c2, c3, but you can also get a and lambda. So that's just a side remark. 
So the real problem is this one. How do we get this limit, uh, the limit C0, which was the original problem anyway, when you have the sequence of numbers converging very slowly to a limit, but in a very regular way. How do you find it? So I'll tell you the mnemonic first. So that was the question. And the answer is you multiply by n to the eighth. That's how you do it. So of course, I'm not entirely serious. Sometimes you multiply by n to the ninth, or for instance here, I multiplied by n to the seventh. But you pick a sort of a smallish integer. One or two would be a little too boring, and 15 or 20 is usually too much, depending on how many numbers you have and what precision. But the point is now we have this. We had the numbers a n, let's say n from 1 to 500, but actually I don't even need that. Let's say I just know them from 475 to 500. I actually only need a segment, which sometimes is much cheaper to just calculate a few of them. So I have these numbers. Then nobody can stop me from multiplying them numerically by n to the eighth. So that's a new set of numbers. So I know these numerically. Now I take the eighth difference. So I re recall that if you have a sequence of numbers bi, then delta b uh, i is bi minus bi plus 1, or sometimes bi minus 1. It doesn't matter. It's a question of normalization. And delta squared bi is you just, it's delta of delta. So it's bi minus 2 bi plus 1 plus bi plus 2 with binomial coefficients and so on. So if you have these numbers, you can just take the difference of n to the 8th a n, take the difference 8 times. So that's the 8th difference. And I prefer to divide by 1 over 8 factorial. Now, let's put in our unsatz. Our unsatz was that a n had an expansion. I'm sorry, I keep changing notations because I didn't uh, plan it carefully enough. I'm assuming that it has an asymptotic expansion in 1 over n. I'm just assuming that. I don't know the CIs. Well, then when I multiply by n to the 8th, this will be a polynomial of degree 8. And then the next term will be c9 over n, and the next will be c10 over n squared, and so on. Now when I take the difference, the difference of a function, f of x minus f of x minus 1, is roughly the same as a derivative. And for a polynomial, it's trivial to see that a polynomial that starts with n to the 8th, its first difference starts, just like its derivative, with 8 n to the 7. So when you take the first, the first difference, this part will become a new polynomial, which is degree 8 n to the 7. When you take the first difference, then 8 times 7 and so on. At the end, it'll be 8 factorial, but I'm dividing. So it'll be c0. But these terms will all give 0. Why is that? Well, because a polynomial degree 7, when you differentiate it 8 times, gives 0. But if you take its 8th difference, it also gives 0. So the c0 that we wanted has survived. But the next 8 terms have been killed. Now let's look at c9. When you take the, ninth der the, der the 8th derivative of 1 over n to the 9, uh, of 1 over n, excuse me, you get uh, 8 factorial divided by n to the 9th. And so the next term, since I'm dividing by 8 factorial, will be c9 over n. In other words, the new sequence has exactly the same kind of asymptotic behavior as the original one, with the same c0, but c1, c2 up to c8 have all been killed. c9 is unchanged. To be honest, the next one is not just c10, because the eighth derivative of 1 over n squared is 9 factorial. So when I divide minus, actually, so when I divide by 8 factorial, I've lost a factor of 9, but that's not very serious. So, sorry, 9th and 10th. So now let's say, now I just take this at n equals 500. Well, this will be c0 plus roughly c9 over 500 to the 9th. So where in the original series, if I just computed for n equals 500 and taken that as an approximation, I would have been off by 1 over 500, which is the third decimal. But now I'm off by 1 over 500 to the 9th, which is the you know, 25th decimal. And so I suddenly have 25 digits accuracy. And it's clear that I can vary the number 8 and do what I want. So it's very simple to remember, very simple to use. And it works, as I say, in, in this case. In this particular case, this form you can prove easily by Sterling's form. It's a lot more work than doing it numerically. In the other, it's not known. And, the, and so it's nice to have a numerical method. So that was one of my chapters. Now, since on the little blue uh, advertisement, I wrote two sample problems. One of them, uh, this actually came up in a research uh, problem that I'm looking at with uh, Vasily Golishev. 
uh, he had a conjecture which I thought we could prove, and I'm, we don't quite have a proof, but we're very close. Uh, he pointed out that you, this makes sense even if n is a complex number. And for instance, if you take a minus a half, well, here I can put infinity. When, when n is a positive integer, I can put infinity because n over k will stop anyway when k is n. But now this makes sense for every n. It's an analytic function. It's convergent. But it converges roughly like 1 over n square, k squared. So it converges very slowly, but it converges. And in particular, if n is minus a half, it's the sum minus a half over k to the power fourth, which is one of the two things I put on the blue sheet. So he had a conjecture that this was equal to a factor, which I think is 16 over pi squared times L of F2, where just for fun, it has nothing to do with my story today, I'll say what F is. F is the modular form eta of 2 tau to the fourth times eta of 4 tau to the fourth. So most of you know a little bit about modular forms, or at least have seen this. But anyway, I can write it out. It's 1 minus q to the 2n to the fourth times 1 minus q to the 4n to the fourth. So it starts q minus 4q squared plus uh, some terms that I don't quite remember, uh, minus 2 q cubed plus 24q to the fourth. And so this thing has an L series. L of fs is just the corresponding Dirichlet series. But of course, that, doesn't, that converges extremely badly. I'm not even sure. I think it doesn't even converge at all for s equals 2. But even if it did, it would be very slow. So you, to compute this numerically, you need some tricks, which many people know. And it's not my subject. But anyway, if you simply say any sum is a limit, because a sum is the limit of its nth partial sums. So you apply the limiting method I told you before to this sum. Then in point zero on a simple table computer to laptop, in 0 0.01 seconds, you get 500 digits. Well, actually, quite a bit more on this. And in another hundredth of a second, 500 digits of that. And they agree. So although it's still maybe not proved, we at least know that this identity is true to 500 decimals. But both of these things are, not, are either extremely slowly convergent or divergent. So this isn't quite, well, it's related to asymptotics. I'm using this extrapolation method to get at these numerical values. So that's what I wanted to say on the numerical side. So that was the first topic, was numerical extrapolation. Uh, so maybe I should list the topics. I didn't at the beginning because I don't know how far I'll get. So the first was numerical extrapolation. Given the first 500 elements of a sequence, try to give, give the full asymptotic behavior when n goes to infinity. So the next thing I want to talk about is, as a kind of an application of asymptotics, special values of L functions. So here I'll just very briefly give the result, because it's a very useful thing that everyone should have seen. And if anybody's interested in the proof and, and comes back, it's a possibility for you know, what we could discuss after the pause. But so let me just write the theorem. So in L series, well, L functions is the same. It's just a synonym as Dirichlet series. So a Dirichlet series means that instead of having a power series, a sum a n x to the n, you have a power series a n n to the x. But it's usual to call x s and actually to call it minus s. So the classical notation for a simple Dirichlet series is the sum a n over n to the s. And now I want to know when does this thing, so this will, let's say, it should converge somewhere. And then it'll converge everywhere to the right of that point, uh, eventually, absolutely. So I have an absolutely convergent series in some right half plane. I want to know when can I continue it analytically, and what are the values? And it turns out the simple values, the only ones for which you can really have a general method, are the values at negative integers, well, including 0, so non-positive integers. So the question is analytic continuation. So first, you have to make sense of this when n is negative, or 0, and then you have to evaluate it. So just to whet your appetite, of course, I gave the example. Example, a n is 1 for all n. Then L of s is the function that everyone calls a of s. And unfortunately, everyone calls the Riemann zeta function. I don't know why. It's Euler's function that Euler studied 110 years earlier, uh, which is, of course, just 1 plus 1 over 2 to the s. And then Euler 
famously found that zeta of 2 is pi squared over 6 and zeta of 4, but he also found that zeta of minus 1 makes sense, actually even zeta of 0, it's minus a half, and zeta of minus 2 also, but all the even ones are 0 except that. Zeta of minus 1 is minus a twelfth, zeta of minus 3 is 1 over 120, zeta of minus 5 is minus 1 over 252, and so on. And so that's what I put on the blue sheet. Uh, what does it mean to say that the sum, n to the fifth, which is obviously divergent, positive and integral, is equal to this number, which is finite, rational, and negative? It looks crazy. And that's what Euler wrote in his paper of uh, 1749. He wrote that this looks crazy, and the reader will think he's lost his mind to write such nonsense. But it really makes sense, and he explains. And of course, he was completely right. So the question is, how can we uh, do, well, not just the Riemann zeta function, but any L? And so there's a general theorem, which is very easy to prove, very easy to state. And so I'll just state it in case you haven't seen it, because it's a good thing to know. So theorem, let L of S equal to sum. Uh, so by this, I just mean the ANs are some complex numbers. And this should converge for at least one value of S. Then it'll automatically converge for all sufficiently large real part, S with large real part. OK. Assume that the corresponding power series, so the corresponding power series, you take the same coefficients, n from 1 to infinity, but you put uh, x to the n. Actually, q to the n might look better. So you change the 1 over n to the s to x to the n. And actually, it turns out it's a little more convenient to replace x by e to the minus t. The x before would be tending to 1 from below, so the t will be tending to 0 from above. So let's maybe put this. But you'll see that if t is positive, then e to the minus nt is exponentially small. If this converges for some complex number s, then the ans have at most polynomial growth. So there's no problem of convergence here. This continues. This certainly makes sense. This function that's called the g of t makes sense for all positive t. So if that power series, which certainly converges, and therefore it's a perfectly good function, so I can just say the corresponding function, uh, g, has an asymptotic, and now again the word asymptotic, in the sense that I started my talk with. So asymptotic expansion, g of t, looks, uh, well, actually it just means it's a C infinity function from the right, as I already said. So it has an asymptotic expansion, which just means it's C infinity from the right, it's infinitely differentiable. In other words, g of t has a limit, so it's continuous with limiting value zero. Then g of t minus b0 divided by b1, that would be the derivative, sorry, g of t minus b0 divided by t has a limit b1, that would be the derivative, the second derivative, and so on. So I'm just saying if g of t is C infinity at the origin, and therefore it's an asymptotic expansion that's completely equivalent, then two very good things happen. I'm now writing backwards, I'm sorry. Uh, two very good things happen. First of all, one, L of s is equal to an entire function of s. In other words, it, has an, it was originally only holomorphic, well, conversion and then holomorphic in some half plane far to the right, but it now automatically is a function for all s with no poles, holomorphic function. And secondly, for all n greater than or equal to 0, the value of L of minus n, this universal form, it's minus 1 to the n times n factorial times bn. I won't prove it, but I just want to have written it there. I'll give an example in a middle minute. But before that, I want to slightly generalize the thing. If I can find some colored chalk, which yes, I can. So let's say slightly more generally that there's also a term here. I didn't leave room for it. Beta divided by t. I mean, there are many more general forms, but let's take the simplest. It's called the G of t has a Laurent series expansion, so it has one polar term, beta over t, and then b0 plus b1t. Well, then all the changes here is that if you, that there's a pole at s equals 1. The residue of that pole is beta, but that's the only pole. There's only a single simple pole at s equals 1. The difference is entire, and this function is unchanged. So that's very, very simple. 
Okay, and just now as an example, let's do the Riemann zeta function since that's what I started with. So this is special values of Dirichlet series. So in the case of the Riemann zeta function, if L of S is zeta of S, that means that A of N is one for all N, then G of T is simply the sum from one to infinity, E to the minus NT. But of course, that's a geometric series. So you can sum it. It's one over E to the T minus one if T is positive. And this, by the very definition of the Bernoulli numbers, is the sum L from zero to infinity, BL, L Bernoulli number over L factorial, T to the L minus one. So that's the formula. And therefore, we immediately get that zeta of S is equal to one over S minus one plus an entire function. In other words, it has a meromorphic extension to all S with a unique pole, which is a simple pole of residue one at S equals one. And zeta of minus n, well, I need the coefficient of t to the n, so n is l plus one, so it's b n plus one over n plus one factorial, but I'm multiplying by n factorial, and so it's just minus one to the n, b n plus one over n plus one. And that's the famous formula, which in the case n equals five will give you the minus one over 252 that we just had. So that's another good thing to know, and it's not really asymptotics because these are exact formulas, but it's asymptotic in the sense that in this case, here, this series actually converges as it happens. This particular series converges for t less than two pi. But there are many cases where the b ends are such that this series is divergent, but it makes no difference. If it's, so long as it's asymptotically correct, you still get the analytic continuation and this. And the proof is, is three lines, it's very easy. Okay, so now I want to come to my third topic. And there's a very nice application of all of these from physics, which uh, if I do anything after the pause, if there is a continuation after the pause, maybe I'll give that because it illustrates all of the techniques. But for the moment, I'm going to skip it and go to the uh, next general thing. So again, I'm trying to show you tricks that I found over the years, more in my own work, that I haven't really ever seen, very easy but that are extremely useful in the everyday life of a mathematician or, or a physicist. You, you have functions. You want to find values of L series at negative values. You want to numerically ex extrapolate. And the third is something that uh, you very much want, which is the behavior. Well, the asymptotic behavior. I'm an American, so there's no you. Asymptotic behavior of a series of the form, well, a function of the form, g of x. Well, I'll call it g of t which is a function, this is some nice function that you know, but now you take, and the function nice means it should be smooth at zero, let's say, C infinity, something like that, and a little small at infinity. So small might be O of T to the minus one minus epsilon for some positive epsilon, something like that. So the picture of F will be, you know, it eventually goes to zero, but it can be an absolutely arbitrary function. And now the, the kind of series that you find very, very, very frequently in mathematics, a huge number of problems can be put into this form, is you take the sum f of t plus f of 2t plus f of 3t and so on. You want to sum up this whole thing. And because, so, but, and you want to know, of course, if t is large, there's no problem. This is the dominating term in some sense. But if t is very small, then each term is tending to a constant. So you get the constant in the often. It's not really clear what to do. So I'm interested in the asymptotic behavior of this as t tends to zero. So I'm going to give you a theorem which tells you what is the asymptotic. So the question is, what is the asymptotic behavior of g of t as t tends to zero? Obviously, I have to make some assumptions. So again, I'm going to make an assumption well, I can use, so let's assume that f itself, I said, is smooth at infinity at zero. So that means, again, that it has an asymptotic expansion, Taylor series expansion, not necessarily convergent, uh, as t goes to zero. In the same sense, I've been saying that f of t tends to a zero, f of t minus a zero divided by t, which is the derivative, tends to a one, and so on. So let's assume that. And it's a bit smaller than infinity. Well, before I write down the theorem, let me solve it in two different ways. One is Riemann's way. Well, Riemann's way would be this. T is very small, so here's f of t. I mean, t is this distance. So f of t is here, 
f of 2t is that, f of 3t. So you're just summing, well, admittedly all the way to infinity, uh, at intervals uh, you know, of, of width of t, which is very small. So it's clear that this is an approximation to the Riemann integral. And therefore, it's clear that you have, should have the asymptotics i over t, i over t as t tends to 0, where i is the integral of f from 0 to infinity. So that would be Riemann's answer, it's, but it's very crude. It's only one term, but at least it's correct. Now, Euler, who is not crude at all, but not correct, uh, so Euler's way will be much less crude. We'll give lots of terms, but it's wrong. And it's certainly not proved, as you'll see in a minute. You simply do the funding. You'll say, well, g of t, you just ignore all convergence problems. g of t is the sum, m from 1 to infinity, f of mt. But, but f of t is the sum ak, t to the k. So here I'll have ak times mt to the k. So interchanging blithely, ignoring convergence completely, just interchanging the sum. Of course, this was already false. It becomes much falser. After I interchange, we'll get the sum ak, t to the k, times 1 to the k plus 2 to the k, up to infinity, which is obviously divergent. But on the other hand, Euler himself computed this. It's what we now call zeta of minus k. And he gave the formula that I just told you with the Bernoulli number. So though the method was horrendously illegal, the final result at least makes sense. This is a perfectly good power series, formal power series. It may diverge because these blow up like factorials. But at least there's a formal power series. And it's the same as the original power series of f, the same ak multiplying the same t to the k, but then each one multiplied by a constant, which is the Bernoulli number. For instance, the coefficient of t squared gets divided by 6. And so the theorem is very short. Sum. It's the sum of those two. So the actual answer is uh, it's not very beautiful because I'm not much of an artist. It's i over t plus that sum, and that is correct now to all orders. So that also is a nice mnemonic. After you've seen that, you can't forget the answer. You do it the Riemann way, which gives the correct asymptotics, but is very crude. You do the Euler way, which tells you what all the other coefficients should be. And indeed, now it's exactly correct. And again, the proof isn't very hard. It's an incredibly useful thing. So now uh, I spoke so fast that I actually have some time left. So I want to give, I gave several applications of the first thing, the numerical ex extrapolation. I gave you three examples. The Aperi numbers, their asymptotics, the asymptotics of these numbers coming from quantum cohomology, and the evaluation of the infinite sum dividing a with the index minus a half. For the second special values of L functions, I only gave you one application, which was zeta of minus n. There are many more, and that's the one I might do after the pause. But let me give you at least one example of how to apply this thing so that you'll see to use this, you have to first remember it, but I hope that you'll find it very easy to remember with this mnemonic. You take the sum of the Euler way and the Riemann way. But I also want to show you how to use it. There are many, many cases where you can't see immediately that it's applicable. But if you practice a bit, then you find that it's applicable in many situations. So I've chosen one example I like. My favorite field is modular forms. So I'll take an example that if you use the theory of modular forms, it would be obvious in certain cases and hopeless in others. But we're not going to use the theory of modular forms, and it'll be obvious in all cases. So I'm going to reproduce a result which is well known and trivial using modular forms, but not using them, and also in much more generality. So let me uh, take the following functions. Uh, GK. K is a is natural number, but at least two. And GK, I'll call it Q. And those of you who know modular forms won't be surprised at the choice of letter. So it might be G2 of Q, G3 of Q. This is the infinite sum. Which is, it's just a power series in Q, Q to the n. And the coefficient of Q to the n is sigma k minus 1 of n. I could use sigma k and shift everything. But if you do know modular forms, k is what you'd expect. It's the weight. So this thing is simply, by definition, the sum of the divisors of n, which by convention means positive divisors, to the power k minus 1. 
OK, so for instance, let's read, write out a couple. These are highly convergent sums because this is bounded by a small power of n, and that's exponentially small if, as I'm going to assume, q is less than 1. So I'm in the unit disk, complex unit disk, and this series converges exponentially fast. So there's no problem. So just to write out a few terms, g2 of q, well, the sum of the divisors to any power of 1 is just 1. So they all will start with 1. But then for q squared, the divisors of 2 are 1 and 2, so I get 3. The divisors of 3 are 1 and 3, so I get 4. The divisors of 4 are 1, 2, and 4, so I get 7, and so on. And similarly, g3 of q, I take the sum of the squares. So here it's 1 and 4. And here it's 1 and 9. And here it's 1 and 4 and 16, which is probably 21, and so on. So these are just completely explicit power series, highly rapidly convergent if q is less than 1 in absolute value, because their coefficients of polynomial growth, the coefficients are integers. And we want to know the asymptotics, but to very high precision, the complete asymptotics, as q tends to 1, but it's tending, of course, in the unit circle. So it can't be bigger than 1. It's, say, along the real axis, it's tending to 1. So how do you do that? Well, first, Let's assume that we're in the, just for those of you who do know a little, multiple forms, one only needs the very, very first example. If k is, first of all, not 2, but also not odd, but even, so if it's even and at least 4, then, let me make sure that I have the, uh, get all the normalizations right, then, Modular forms theory, if you don't know what modular forms are, it plays no role. I'm just saying there is a theory, but most of you do know it. A modular forms theory implies that you have an exact functional equation. And the exact functional equation is as follows. I take this function gk. I change the variable q to e to the minus 2 pi t. That turns out to be better than e to the minus t. I mean, it makes the formula simpler. And I add a constant, which is bk over 2k, the very same Bernoulli number that we already had. So this is actually 1 half times eta of 1 minus k if k is even, which it is. OK, so, so I look at this thing. And now modular forms theory tells you that this function, this exact function, has an exact functional equation. It's equal to minus 1 to the k over 2, which makes sense because k is even, divided by t to the k times the very self-same function but where t has been inverted. t has been replaced by 1 over t. That's an exact formula coming from multiple forms theory and not particularly hard to prove. And now this thing, of course, is exponentially small as t goes to 0. So in particular, as t goes to 0, which means q goes to 1, q is e to the minus 2 pi t, then this thing is exponentially small. So in particular, it's smaller than an ever so large power of t as t goes to 0. So that means that in the asymptotic expansion of e to the minus 2 pi t, there are only two terms. There's minus 1 to the k over 2 times minus bk over 2k times t to the minus k. And then there's plus bk over 2k. And then that asymptotic expansion is correct to all orders. In other words, it's a terminating expansion. A priori, there could have been infinitely many powers, but only two powers occur. Well, it's a Laurent expansion. There's a one negative power, one zero power, and that's all. So to all orders in T, we have that. So that's not what I'm talking about. That's not asymptotics. This is exact and comes from multiple forms theory. So the question you might say, well, this looks hopeless if you didn't know this functional equation. But I want to show you that not only it's not hopeless, it's easier, and now we can do it even if k is 2, which was an exception here. It's a so-called quasi multiform form, but also if k is odd, in which case you can't use multiple forms at all because it isn't multiple and there is no function equation. So what do you do? Well, what you do is this. gk of q was the sum, n from 1 to infinity, sum d divides n, d positive, d to the k minus 1, q to the n. So turning that around, that means it's the sum d from 1 to infinity, d to the k minus 1. And now you have all q to the n, where n is a multiple of d. So renaming the variables, that's d to the k minus 1. Oh, sorry, not renaming, just summing the geometric series. You get this formula. That was just a very simple transformation. 
Now, we make the transformation q equals e to the minus t. Here, there's no particular reason to put in the two pi, so I'll just call it e to the minus t. And then you see that you have to do a slight trick. So we've already made a change of variables, changing q to e to the minus t. But I also want to multiply by t to the k minus 1. After all, that's harmless. If I know the asymptotics with that factor, I know it without, and so on. So if I do that, then I see that this is the sum, d from 1 to infinity, of d times t to the k minus 1 divided by e to the power dt minus 1. Right? Because q to the d over 1 minus q to the d is 1 over e to the dt minus 1. And d to the k minus 1 times t to the k minus 1 is dt. So changing d to m just to match my preceding notation, this is exactly a special case of my preceding thing. Well, this is fk. fk of t is t to the k minus 1 over e to the t minus 1. Well, now I'm done. Because I take the formula, remember, it was the sum. So there's the Riemann term, i over t. So i here is the integral from 0 to infinity, t to the k minus 1 over e to the t minus 1 dt. You should be able to do this in your head. If you can't, then try tonight. And you'll find in five minutes that you can. It's very easy. So uh, i, this integral, is simply k minus 1 factorial times Riemann zeta of k. And so that's the leading term. That's this term, i over t. And the other terms, well, we have to take this expansion. But remember that 1 over e to the t minus 1 has an expansion that we know. It's bl over l factorial times t to the power l minus 1. But here I'm multiplying by t to the k minus 1. So it'll become k plus l minus 2. And so now if you apply the Riemann business, which remember this zeta of minus k, well, I shouldn't have called it k. I should have called it something else. But anyway, this is minus b. There might be a sign over k plus 1, essentially. So this will become, uh, that means that gk of t, or rather t to the k minus 1 gk of t, because that's, it's t to the k minus 1 gk of t to which we can apply this trick. So t to the k minus 1 gk of minus 1 of t, we're nearly done is this integral, which was k minus 1 factorial over z of k, divided by t, plus the sum l greater than or equal to 0, b l over l factorial. And then if I got it right, which I may not have, it's k plus l minus 1 over k plus l minus 1. I think there's a minus sign. It doesn't matter. Here, t to the k plus l minus 2, but then I might as well divide by t to the k minus 1 and take the thing I actually wanted. So modular mistake, I, when I did it at home, this was L and not L minus 1. But this is essentially the expansion. If the details don't matter if it went too fast. The point is that I applied this recipe. And in three minutes, I just wrote down the complete expansion. I didn't have to know modularity properties. I didn't have to do anything exact. It's a purely asymptotic formula. Now, if you look at this, you'll see it's very amusing. The Bernoulli numbers, as uh, was already discovered by Seik and Bernoulli, uh, 350 years ago, they have the property that all of the odd ones, except the first one, are 0. So therefore, if k is even, which is what I first assumed k was 4, 6, 8, if k is even, then k minus 1 is odd. So l and k plus l minus 1 have opposite parities. So one of them is odd. But all odd Bernoulli numbers are 0 except uh, for 1, if L is 1. But even if L is 1, then this is BK. No, sorry. So that's right. So what you will get, if K is uh, contained in the set that I originally had, the nice modular set, if it happens to be even and at least 4, then because k is even, k plus l minus 1 with l of opposite parities, the only way this term can survive is if l is 1. And then b a half is minus a half. The z of k is also bk times some very simple factor. And here l is 1, so l minus 1 is 0. So it's something else, bk uh, So what you get in this case is a terminating series, just like we had before. You have an asymptotic series, which I wrote down to all orders. This is, of course, when I write equal. It's 
asymptotic. The series doesn't necessarily converge. Here it does because it terminates. But as an asymptotic series, that means no matter how many terms you take, the difference between this and this is the next term. But here it stops. There are only two terms. The first one is a simple multiple of bk. The next is b with simple multiple over t to the k. There's some other multiple of bk. And that's the only two terms because every other binary thing is zero. If k is two, then it's the same. You get roughly, the, it depends whether you put the two pi or not. So I won't try to, I have it in my notes, but I don't know if it's worth trying to do it exactly correctly. So in the case of g2, you'll get that g2, this time I'll put the two pi back in. If what I just did here had been correct in this case, there would be two terms, one over 24 t squared and one over 24. But because of the fact that in that case, you have another term, if k is two, you can have l is zero. Then k minus one plus l is one, which is also non-zero. So you get one extra term, which when you work it out, is minus one over four pi t. So you immediately get, which multiple forms theory also tells you, it's more difficult, that there's a similar asymptotic expansion, again terminating. This is true to all orders. So the full power series has only three terms, one over t squared, one over t, and one. If k is two, if k is four, six, or eight, there are only two terms, one over t to the k, and one. But if k is, for instance, three, well, then it doesn't terminate, because if k is three or any odd number, then L and K plus L minus one have the same parity, and so you get all the terms when T is even. So for instance, I'll just write down the answer for G3. It's two times eight of three over T cubed minus one over 12 T plus T over 1440 uh, plus or minus T cubed over 181440, et cetera, but now it doesn't terminate. There are infinitely many terms. Multiple forms theory would not tell you that, the series doesn't converge anyway, so it's not really a function on the right, but it's a perfectly good asymptotic expansion. And so with no particular trouble, we found the asymptotic expansion to all orders. I intentionally went very fast. I just want to show you that by applying the, the rule, you can in a few minutes take a series to which it doesn't seem that the thing implies, this sigma k minus one of n, but often by transforming one series into another form, you can make a new thing and apply this general principle. So I'll just repeat again, the general principle is that if f is a ni nice function, then the sum f of nx is also a nice function, and you can find its asymptotics as x goes to zero. Then there are many variants. For instance, you might not sum over integers, but half integers, or integers plus alpha, where alpha is some shift. Or you might have an f which has uh, some singularity at the origin, not just a power series, but a term one over t, or log t, or square root of t. And all of those things can be done. And then you have to change the Euler and Riemann thing very slightly, but essentially it's the same. And then you get a huge number of new applications. So I can also give a reference for all of these things so that if you want to see more slowly how it works, you can, you can look and there are written examples. But I want to show you kind of a variety of numerical methods that you can use to, to get at these three kinds of things. So extrapolation of series, uh, interpolation, or values at negative inches of Dirichlet series, and evaluation of sums in the form f of nx. So uh, maybe I'll even stop five minutes ahead of the hour, unusually. I had another example, but it's, it's too, too hard work. So I'll stop. We can, you can ask questions now. We'll have coffee, and if anybody wants, I can say in a word what the application is that, if you would like, I could do after the pause. But if not, I can also give you the reference, and you could just go and read it. It's an application to a thing that the physicists have and do in a, an extremely I mean, non-rigorous way that doesn't make much of any sense. And also, they get only the leading term. And the, if you do it using this kind of technique, you can get the full answer. So I'll just say the physical thing is what's called the Casimir effect. And the actual thing that the physicists want is this completely crazy sum. You take the triple sum over three integers, L, M, and N in Z of, well, I don't know why, I'm, oh, there's a normalization that I've forgotten, that's why. Uh, the normalization is just for convenience. Uh, so there's gonna be a parameter, lambda, and the physicists are interested when lambda goes to infinity, but you can also ask for fixed lambda or for lambda tending to zero. 
and I can, you know, one can do all three. And there's a normalization that I put in for convenience to make the formulas look nice, so minus 2 pi. But it's really a crazy thing that the physicists need. It's some electrostatic quantum effect between two metal plates that are very close to each other. And it's, uh, you assume there's some lattice of atoms, and you end up that you have to, you want to study the astronomical behavior for lambda large of the triply infinite series, sum over L, M, and N, of the square root of L squared plus M squared plus lambda squared N squared. So that's even worse than, uh, than Euler's thing, because the individual terms are all tending to infinity, but they're no longer integers. They're just some complicated numbers. The thing obviously doesn't make sense as it stands. So the problems here are first to make sense of it, so make a well-defined function that has this interpretation, then show how to compute that, because there's a fairly easy way to do that, but it would be very, very slowly convergent. How do you actually compute it? Let's say lambda is 1, and you want f of 1 to 100 digits. You can do that very easily. And then also find the asymptotics when lambda is small or big. So even if I don't present that, that was the application. And I can tell you where to look at it if you want and, and read everything I've told in much you know, slower pace and with examples and details. There's a very nice book, which will eventually have five volumes by uh, Ibhad Seidler, which is an introduction to quantum field theory for mathematicians. Well, an introduction, it's 5,000 page volumes, of which the first three have now appeared. But at the end of volume one, there's, or somewhere, it may not be at the end, there's an appendix by, by me, because Seidler asked me if I could give an explanation, a rigorous way of computing, making sense of and computing this Casimir function. And so that was a nice example, and I took advantage of the opportunity to write down all of these asymptotic tricks about Dirichlet series about asymptotics. So that's, it's published. It's also on our website. If you just go to Google and type my name uh, and then find side, you'll find it instantly, and all of the formulas are there. So I'll stop with that, and as I say, questions are more than welcome. OK. Yeah, short questions, because I'm short. No questions. That's too few, too short. Does anybody have a favorite series that they would like to sum? Or a se sequence of numbers that they want to know the asymptotics? It actually would surprise me if some of you didn't, because as I say, it happens to me easily once a week that I have a series of numbers that came up in some problem. And either I do know how to do it theoretically, but it would be a lot of work. It's much quicker to use the asymptotic method and just have the computer tell you. And very often, like in the quantum cohomology problem, it's not known theoretically. And then it's very nice to be able to at least convince yourself that the asymptotics are as they are, or the sum is as it is. I have one comment. Uh, if anyone has one. I've actually only ever heard that from you, but I have heard it from you. Anyway, thanks. <laughs>